We're very fortunate here in the Reno area to have uh, Captain Reagan with the Sierra Fire Protection District. Uh, Mark is well known throughout the West. He's invited to be a speaker uh, throughout the country um, to talk about evacuation. Uh, one of his claim to fame is I think he has held the largest practice evacuation uh, in the country that we're aware of, and that was the Galena area several years ago yep. on it. And uh, Mark has put together an excellent program for homeowners on training you how to evacuate safely and effectively. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Captain Reagan. Thanks, Ed. Uh, good evening. <coughs> um, yeah, as talking about the Grizzly Fire, we're going to show you a little video about that uh, on how we were able to accomplish such a excellent drill and also um, it was right here right in Washoe County right off of Mount Rose Highway. Uh, we're going to talk about PRIDE. <clears throat> we call our, pro our program uh, PRIDE. It's preparing residents in disaster evacuations. And it's not just uh, wildland that we would have to evacuate. We would have to evacuate in um, <clears throat> hazardous materials, uh, earthquakes, and, you know there's a couple of different reasons why we uh, would have to evacuate, but we're going to uh, basically focus on a wildland threat and why we would have to evacuate. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, this is a, a clip from the website last week. Uh, for, it was a, a Colorado. Everyone's been watching the news. Colorado has a big fire burning right now. Uh, four missing, 136 homes uh, burned. Uh, the four missing, well, uh, the total was a little bit higher. Uh, it was nine at first when it was first reported, but the four missing, they thought they could stay and defend. They didn't want to evacuate. And uh, going back to Australia uh, two years ago, uh, the same thing. People thought they could stay and defend and didn't want to evacuate. If you prepare your neighborhood and you prepare your house and you prepare your family for uh, a threat to your house on, uh, or your neighborhood as on a wildland, you'll be able to get out in time and your home should be able to survive without you guys there or even minimal effort with the fire department. So that's what these classes are going to be teaching uh, our communities on the fire adapted communities. So preparation and cooperation is going to equal a safe evacuation. Uh, that's our goal about getting out and teaching our residents and preparing and practicing. If you're prepared and you cooperate with the fire department and the surrounding agencies, you'll be able to get out safe. And by getting out safe and fast, the fire department can get in and do their job keeping the fire small or mitigating the problem uh, if it has to do with something else besides a wildland fire. Two types of evacuations we have. We have uh, when you have time to prepare and immediate evacuation. Uh, two years ago, our drill was a fire moving into the area you guys had time to prepare to evacuate. Uh, this year's drill that we did was a hazardous material spill. You didn't have time to do anything. You wanted to get out. It was a chlorine spill that we simulated uh, on Mount Rose Highway. And so you, two types of evacuations. When you have time, about an hour to get your stuff and going. And when we say go, it's immediate. Get out. You have to go. Uh, we're training our residents <clears throat> after they go on through our class and gone through uh, the practicing and stuff, they got it down in about 20 minutes. That's not including large animals. The people with the larger animals, horses and stuff, it's taken them a good 40 minutes to be able to load their horses up and evacuate. But we have checkoff lists. We'll go over that to uh, speed up the process if you, want, if you guys need to evacuate. But I'm going to show you the Grizzly Fire first. Uh, we're pretty proud of it. It is the largest evacuation drill ever conducted in the United States right here in Washoe County. It involved uh, 3,961 residents. We were able to contact door to door. That means we actually went to each residence. We went to about 3,500 of them. So we weren't able to get to everyone. And this was in three hours. Uh, it's a three hour drill. We wanted to see how many people we could actually move and also conduct uh, fighting the fire all in three hours. We had 307 personnel on site. Um, we were able to check in 1,243 residents into Galena High, the evacuation center, within the three hours. Uh, we checked in uh, 390 animals 
anywhere from dogs, cats, snakes, um, rabbits. We had some fish there. You name it, they brought it. Uh, during that check-in process, you really won't see it at an evacuation center, but uh, we were able to microchip 110 animals uh, through a grant. And we also did the reverse 911 system, which is called City Watch in Washoe County. Uh, we talked about, we're going to talk a little bit about that in, uh, after the video, and I'm not sure John might have asked you if you already signed up for it. I'll explain why you're going to want to sign up for the Washoe County City Watch program. So we're going to watch this video, and uh, again, we started with a small group in our district. We started with, actually it was 15 homes we started with. We said, hey, this is a, something that we think we need to get out to the community. We started small. We started a small evacuation where we just stood in a court and said, okay, we're going to have to evacuate. And we went through the steps. And the next year, we did a whole neighborhood. The next year, we did two neighborhoods. And so this was actually our ninth drill. So you guys might be sitting in this room right now thinking, we're never going to be able to get to that level. You don't need to get to that level. All you need to do is get your neighbors behind you. We have this fire department support in Washoe County for this, and we have Living With Fire supporting us. So all you need to do is get your neighbors supported, get it together, and we'll be able to come out and conduct these drills. So if something does happen, we'll be able to evacuate your neighborhood a lot safer and a lot faster so we can do our job. So we're going to watch the video and then we're going to go into how to get your neighborhood too close to that level. So if an incident does happen, you can see, hey, it does work. For all personnel, the evacuation fire is now officially underway. The purpose of a full-scale exercise is to validate emergency plans, test operational procedures, and to encourage communication between public safety agencies and our citizens. The Sierra Fire Protection District conducted a regional evacuation exercise dubbed the Grizzly Fire. Captain Mark Reagan was the planning section chief and exercise designer for Fire Chief Mike Green. Planning and coordination for a full-scale exercise begins months in advance. Meetings were held between neighborhood homeowners with responsibility to alert specific areas. This ensured maximum participation of residents and tested procedures previously established between the citizens and the fire services to be used in an actual neighborhood evacuation. Setup for the exercise began early in the morning. The Galena High School was used for the staging area, evacuee shelter, animal sheltering, feeding, Red Cross operations, and sign-in areas. The incident command post was immediately established near the neighborhoods involved in the evacuation. The incident commander's role is uh, establishing the objectives, um, prioritizing those, those objectives for urgency and, and criticality. The, uh, setting up an incident command post uh, such as you've seen here um, at the uh, high school, uh, building an appropriate incident command organization which is a very organized system that is incrementally built uh, uh, through modules of, of uh, units to accomplish the mission. And probably the most important thing is to be looking out in the future keeping the big picture in mind, uh, kind of that 10,000 foot view of what's happening in the incident and most importantly what its potential is where it's going so we're planning ahead and not reacting. Control of the incident and initiation of the evacuation alert was made from a mobile command post. Upon receiving the reverse notification of the threatening wildland fire, residents began loading their go kits. Important documents, personal items, and pets were placed into their vehicles and they headed for the designated shelter. The lead agency, the Sierra Fire Protection District, with assistance from Washoe County Search and Rescue, conducted an orientation briefing for all the first response agencies and support organizations. Responders were organized into divisions according to standards of ICS, 
the Incident Command System. A variety of exercise scenarios were developed to determine strengths and weaknesses of established plans and first responder training. These scenarios included accidents that could happen during a real evacuation. For example, one resident fell from a ladder while trying to inspect his roof for hot embers. This required a medical rescue response. Two large dogs that could not be evacuated by their owners required the assistance of personnel from the Washoe County Animal Control Services. The dogs had to be captured, loaded, and evacuated from the home. Special needs residents with Parkinson's disease were encountered. They needed additional help from first responders and medical personnel to evacuate their home with critical items, including medicines and their pet. A report of possible looting involved a law enforcement canine unit deployment. They investigated, cleared, and secured an evacuated home. Multiple jurisdictions, agencies, and support groups participated in the Grizzly Fire exercise. The CERT, or Community Emergency Response Teams, canvassed the affected neighborhoods and placed coded tags on homes. This ensures evacuation accountability and aids firefighters to notify residents to evacuate. The Nevada Division of Forestry and Washoe County Sheriff's Office Raven Helicopter Unit supported exercise scenarios with firefighting and rescue aircraft. Air operations are always a key component of any wildland fire event. The American Red Cross set up and conducted the sign-in process for evacuees staying at the Galena High School shelter. I think the success of this was about building relationships either with the interdepartment members or with the community. Well, we're at the end of our evacuation drill today. We had over a thousand residents check into the evacuation center. We had over 300 troops on the ground doing the evacuation. This is an excellent uh, evacuation drill for our community. I uh, got a lot of people involved. I met a ton of people from resources and agencies that I've never seen before, all working together, coming together, and uh, I had a great day today. No exercise is over until the results are analyzed and lessons learned documented. Feedback from all the key players and stakeholders must be collected. This improves future training and operational changes in emergency plans used by the first responder agencies. Equally important are the comments and feedback from the citizens who participated in the exercise. The enhanced relationships and positive interaction between public safety officials and the residents we protect was the most enduring benefit from this full-scale evacuation exercise. <clears throat> now that drill uh, helped the residents and also helped the surrounding agencies, the fire department, police department. Uh, like, I, like I said, it took our plans that we had and um, tested them and we were able to actually capture where we were lacking and improve on that during the drills. And so not only does it benefit the residents uh, on you guys understanding what to do and what's going to be provided to you guys during evacuation, it also helps the fire department and surrounding agencies uh, what they're going to need for the residents. So. Now, we're going to talk about some ways to help relieve the stress during an evacuation. And it's going to be stressful. So by being prepared, you're going to have less stress. You've practiced it. You understand what to do. You're going to be less stressed. And so by doing some of that, uh, one of the things you guys can do is establish uh, community captains in your neighborhood. And the community captains were basically going to be in charge of the phone trees. The phone trees, the way they work, is all I have to do is if we have a, something in the area we're going to have to evacuate or something going on in the area, all you have to do is I have to make three to five phone calls. And those people will call their neighbors and let them know, hey, there's a fire in the area. We might have to evacuate. And also does another thing is if we have a meeting or a training or something going on that we like the residents to know about, we go ahead and use the phone trees and get the message out. 
Um, we do have the reverse 911 system called City Watch uh, for Washoe County. And you can go on to readywashoe.com to register the, your phone numbers. Uh, but to activate that, it's going to take us a good 20 to 30 minutes to activate that system. By the time the incident commander decides where they're going to evacuate, by the time we have to go onto the computer, log on, map it out, send the calls out, uh, it's going to take us some time. So the phone trees, I already have it pre-programmed in my phone. I know John, uh, he's also responsible for the phone trees in our district. All we have to do is make a couple phone calls and the message starts getting out. Uh, maybe not, the messages might not be, hey, we're going to have to evacuate. It may be, hey, there's smoke in the area. It's coming from such and such area. We're not going to have to evacuate at this time, but just stay informed because we might not activate the reverse 911 system, the city watch system, to tell you, hey, there's a fire in the area. We won't do that. We'll only activate that to, if you are going to evacuate. We won't tell you, hey, there's a fire in the area. You're not going to have to evacuate. The only time you're going to get a call from the Ready Washoe uh, city watch system is if you're going to have to evacuate. So the phone trees also helps keep the residents informed. So it's something good to start in your area. Another thing it does on the phone trees is you saw that we ran into medical con uh, problems with some of our residents. The phone trees keeps track of those residents for us. So they'll know that, hey, Sam down the street, he's going to need extra assistance because, you know, he had surgery last week and he can't drive. Uh, so those phone trees keep, help tre keep track of that too, and that's one of their responsibilities. And all it is is um, we do a class, we train our phone tree captains on how to organize the phone tree, and we also test the phone trees during the evacuation drills, where they test it out and see how it's done. Um, now let's talk about the Ready Washo system, the reverse 911 system for the county. And I'll, I'll tell you how the system works. Um, the system is actually an outside area. The computer's not here in Washoe County. You don't want to have your emergency system calling your air, in, in your area that has a disaster. Um, it's an outside it, uh, call coming in. Um, it's back east that actually sends the call in. A couple reasons why you do that is obviously you don't want the computer where the disaster zone is. And also the long distance lines, telephone lines, stay up longer than the local lines. Uh, the way the phone system is set up, so they'll be able to get the message out. The, so the computer's automatically dialing 775. But you can go on to readywashoe.com and register your home phone. You can register your cell phone, your email, and your, uh, to get an email or a text message. So if you're not at home, you're going to get a cell phone. Now, if you have AT&T, you should already be registered with the system. But if you have cable, telephone, or internet phone, you will not be guaranteed to be registered with the system. More than likely, you will not be registered. Uh, the, over the years of doing the drills, uh, even though the cable company says, oh, you're, with the, you're in the 91 system, you're not. Um, don't rely on that. So go on there, register. You can register. I register everything, my cell phone, email, text messages, so I can get the message if I'm not at home, which is recommended because you could be at home, your kids are at home after school, they get the call to evacuate, you're at work working away, you have no idea something's going on. So that's why I register. And uh, again, I would register uh, every single person in the house. All my kids are signed up for it, uh, so they, everyone gets the message. And I also sign up my work email too, so I'm on that a lot more than my home email. And, um, and again, uh, even though you're on AT&T, sign up for I would sign up still. So, uh, and then another thing uh, you're going to want to do in our area, not all areas have different escape, you know, more than uh, have fire escape routes. In our district, just in Mount Rose area, uh, which our district, if you guys don't know, Sierra Fire, is on the west side. Basically, pretty simple. It's the west side of Reno. It's between Reno and Incline. We kind of hug the mountains. That's our district. Uh, in Mount Rose area alone, we have over 68 different evacuation gates. And uh, you'll see a map if you guys grabbed a map. That's Mount Rose. And this is what we hand out to our residents. And we also have a big wall map up in our fire station so the residents can find more than one way out. Because uh, what happens in our, the way the, our subdivisions were built was the main road is one way and one way out. 
well, the residents can get trapped the way the fires spread, or even a hazardous material spill on Mount Rose Highway, they might not be able to access the highway, and that's what we practice this year. They have to find other ways out. So check your area. You might have more than one way out. It's recommended that you know more than one way out. It might be just taking a left instead of taking a right. You can get two ways out. So check with your local area. See if you have emergency escape routes. Um, if you do, see if you can get them at least labeled uh, so other residents will know that's an emergency escape route. And then uh, practice using them so people are, know where they're at. And maybe you can get the county. The county is really good about printing these. Uh, are making them up uh, and uh, let the residents know where they're at. On these uh, emergency ga uh, gates though, what you might want to do, what we have in our area, is we have volunteers that are residents that maintain those gates for us because they're locked because we don't want people to use them on a daily basis and tear up the road like they were. So we had to lock them. And so we came up with a program where there are volunteer gatekeepers. If evacuation is needed, they have their own phone tree. We contact them. They open the gates that we tell them by number. They open the gates and they lock it open. And also they do is they check it on a monthly basis that they make, make sure that no one stuck a rock in front of it or tried to break the lock to use it. We've had that problem. And so they do a monthly check for us. And again, it's just a one hour class that we train our, our volunteers. And it's something you guys might want to consider if you have evacuation gates in your area. So check with your local fire department, uh, drive around, they might have put them in and just not label them. So check, check with your local fire department, they can help you on that. And then conduct uh, evacuations and trainings. Like I said, we started out small. We started out 15, 20 residents, and then we worked all the way up to, you know, 4,000 residents. Uh, so, and uh, this year, April 30th is our next drill. Uh, we're going to try and double that. Um, so, it, you know, again, start out small, test the system out, see what's going to take, and do the trainings. Coming to this class is the first step. Coming to all the classes that uh, Living With Fire is providing is the steps of getting educated on how to make your community a fire adapted community. And see if, they, if your local area, I know Sierra Fire, Truckee Meadows, uh, Incline, they all have a fuels management program where we're trying to reduce the fuels on the public lands in the county to reduce the fire threat. But also we have some grants out there now that will help citizens reduce the fire threat in their area by doing some fuel management work for them, by doing a chipping program where you guys remove the fuel and we'll come out with our chipper and chip it for you. Uh, Carson City has a program where they haul off the material for you to the dump. Uh, Incline, do you guys have a, a chipping program or just at North Lake Tahoe? So Incline has the same chipping program. So uh, contact your local fire department and see what, what's available in your area. So those are just some of the things you can start going, getting established in your community. <clears throat> but I can stand up here and tell you this is what you should have when you evacuate. This is what you need to do to evacuate. But I don't know what you need. So you guys are by coming here and taking the first step and taking the responsibility of preparing yourself and saying, hey, I'm going to also need this and this and this to evacuate. So you guys are coming the first step and taking the responsibility. So some of the information I have here, these are just guidelines you're going to have. But, you know, you can always add to this checkoff list that we're going to go over here in a minute. And because uh, you guys, I don't know if you guys might have 30 cats. You know, we do have a resident in our area that has over 20 cats in her house. So it's going to take a little time to collect those. So <clears throat> we're going to go into uh, preparing the inside of your home. Uh, some of the stuff's on this checkoff list. Uh, have a written evacuation plan. Adapt it to your guys' needs. Um, knowing where to meet in case of evacuation. Where is your evacuation centers? Washoe County is more than likely going to use a high school for an evacuation center um, if there's a need to evacuate. So um, pay attention when we ask you to evacuate where the evacuation center is. More than likely though, we already have the high schools established as an evacuation center. It will not be an elementary school, it won't be a middle school, it's going to be a high school 
to be able to handle the, you know, it's a bigger facility. So um, <clears throat> find your local high school, the closest one to your residence, and that's probably going to be the one you're going to evacuate to. Another thing you're going to want to have is a meeting place um, somewhere in the area if you have to evacuate and you cannot communicate with your loved ones. Because what could happen is if we have a major disaster in the area, phone lines could go down. If we have a major incident in the area, cell phones are going to jam, cell phones are going to go down, and you're not going to be able to communicate with your, res with your loved ones. So have an established meeting spot. Okay, if we have to evacuate and we cannot get a hold of each other, meet at Rayleigh's. Meet at, you know, pick a spot, not right in your neighborhood. Pick a spot away from the neighborhood. We'll meet at the Summit Mall. Uh, you know, at least we can go shopping if we have to evacuate. Uh, you know, or at a certain restaurant. You know, a certain place where you guys have close, um, but an area if you can't communicate, you know where to go. You can always pick the evacuation center, but again, evacuation centers can change. You know, you know, a school could get damaged and we might have to go to a different school. So pick some area that you guys can meet if you can't communicate. Also have, I already talked about, more than one way in, one way out. Uh, again, Mount Rose, if we had a spill on Mount Rose Highway, there's some residents could not go out that way. They have to go all the way into Washoe Valley and they know the back ways on how to get there. Uh, know how to shut off your gas at your home. Is it propane? Is it natural gas? Uh, if it's a wildland fire, we ask you to shut off your gas or your propane. Uh, if it's an it's a, uh, earthquake and you have to evacuate your home, we ask you to shut off your gas or your propane. Uh, so during earthquakes, it could have shifted, broke the line. Um, so those are things you're going to want to know. Maintain and update your to-go bag. Um, we we're lucky enough to get some to-go bags for our, uh, our area. Uh, through the emergency manager, we're working on another grant to purchase some more, but just a little duffel bag, uh, or it could be a duffel bag, a big one, but we usually like to keep the little ones, uh, one for each person or two for a person. And what you're going to want to have on the checkoff list, it's a laminated, double-sided, it's a laminated one. These are just some guidelines on what t helpful things that you might want to think about you're going to want to have in your to-go bag. Um, and, uh, you know, if you ever lose this list, you can always go to our website or Living With Fire. And they have it on their website. But uh, bank documents, um, credit card, copies of your credit cards or your credit cards. Because, um, you know, at the last minute, you're not going to think about, oh, I need, you know, if you have to evacuate and you can't go back, you're going to need some kind of cash. Your medications, maybe put... Uh, you know, maybe not 30 day supply as a medication, but at least a week supply of medication in your bottles and in the correct labeled bottles in your to-go bag. And uh, that way you won't have to worry about uh, going through your medicine cabinet and finding where all your medicine is before you have to evacuate. Just have them in your to-go bag. Again, on some of these things, people are asking about the bank statements and stuff. Should I have the originals? Well, no, you don't have to have originals. Have the photocopy, so at least you have account numbers and you can uh, track them that way. Uh, because you might have them in your safe, but again, the safe is fireproof. Some of the safes are not waterproof. And so if a lot of, you know, something happens, uh, you know, you could open it up and it's just a mess. So it's a good idea to have uh, copies of that. Passport, again, your passport. Uh, little things, your, sun, your glasses so you can read. And also, you know, throw a little $9 radio in there from, uh, Walmart or something, uh, so you can listen and have contact if, if you have to evacuate. Uh, our, our recommendation is take pictures of the inside of your house or videotape it and put it on a CD or a thumb drive and put it in there. Uh, and that's so if, you know, it makes it easier going if something did happen to your house and you have to go through an inventory of everything, uh, you forget a lot of stuff. You're going to be stressed, you're not going to remember stuff until maybe a year later that, oh yeah, well, I also had that. But if it's on the video, it helps the insurance company. Address books, cell phone chargers. Uh, go out and buy an extra cell phone charger. You know, it doesn't have to be the nice fancy one, but things like that. And enough clothes for three to five days. They don't have to be fancy clothes. Just something that will keep you warm and keep you dry 
in your to-go bag. And our recommendation is put that to-go bag either by the front door or by the front closet, leave it in your trunk of your car, uh, or in your garage, somewhere where you can grab it on your way out and you can, you can have it. Let's talk about um, a fire in your area that you have to evacuate, and, but you have time. It's not an immediate threat. You get the call, hey, there's a fire in the area. We're probably going to have to evacuate. What should you do? When in doubt, if you don't feel comfortable, go. You know, take your stuff and go. But if you have time, go through this checkoff list. You know, it's laminated for a reason. You can mark on it, do the checkoff list, and it'll last. We ask you to turn on your exterior lights, uh, even though it could be in the middle of the daylight. Uh, we ask you to turn your lights on because um, smoky conditions, and when a fire hits, it, it could be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and if, when a fire's coming through, it looks like it's midnight with the smoke and the ash, everything blowing. So what that will help is us to identify where the homes are in your area, where your home is sitting uh, by the outline of your house, either by air or by the road in the fire inch, from the fire trucks. Again, some of these, <clears throat> when we have a large fire in the area, it's not your local fire department that might be there protecting your home. It could be when we have a fire, we're calling Carson City, we're calling Incline, we're calling Reno. And we could even call California for help. We're calling Douglas County, Story County. These are pe firefighters coming in, they're not familiar with the area. And so by you having your lights on, it helps us find the homes faster. Uh, put your patio furniture inside your garage or a shed, or if you don't have room in your shed or your garage, at least take the, your patio furniture that has a nice thick cushions on it that are right underneath your eaves of your house, take it and at least throw it into the, your yard. Because uh, what will happen is the embers will come in, land on that, catch it on fire, and then catches the house on fire. Uh, a lot of homes are lost not by the flame front, it's by embers. Embers getting into the furniture, getting underneath the deck, getting into the eaves of your house, your vents of your house, your gutters that are not cleaned out. That's what is losing a lot of homes. Um, I was down in Southern California two years on the, when they had the, all those fires going on. Brand new home, 100 foot of dirt all the way around it. Stucco siding, tile roof, everything was correct except for the vents. It was a good house. We saved it. Three hours later, it was on fire. An ember got in it. And uh, so that's how homes were being lost. So the next thing is, is uh, cover your vents, close up your vents, <coughs> retrofit your vents. Uh, last week at the last class it showed different types of vents that are out there to retrofit. Or what you could do is have prefab uh, plywood that you already have screws in it and it's pre-cut. You just go and cover your vents on your, down underneath your house and also in your attic area. Uh, you can have that. The only problem with that is uh, the ones around your house are easy to do. If you have to get up on your roof and cover the vents, those are hard to do. So our recommendation is retrofit them out. Save your, save, uh, your house that way. Hook up your garden hose outside. You hook up your garden hose outside, but don't turn it on. What's going to happen is if you turn it on, embers come in, burn through that hose, and then it's just going to leak, and then you're going to run, the water's just going to run, and we're going to end up losing water pressure in that system. Or if you're on a well, your well is just going to constantly be running. Uh, Park your car outside, heading out. Um, you could park it in your garage as long as, and park in facing out, as long as you're able to lift the garage door up if you lose power. Our recommendation is if you park it inside the garage, uh, you release the emergency release on your garage, and make sure you can lift it up and pull your car out. Because what's going to happen is you could lose power in the area. Everyone relies on that clicker in that car to open that garage door. You lose power when a fire comes through and you hit that button, that garage door is not opening. So make sure you, to speed up the process, you release it, and then that way you can just lift the garage door up, drive out, and go. Well, that's one of the things you learned from your Yeah. During the drill, we were training the residents to park your car inside, release it, wait to go, and then when you get the call, go. Our residents in one area they have to have solid wood core door, uh, wood doors on their garages. 
we get a call in the middle of our drill that, hey, from 911, I'm part of the drill and I can't get out. We had to go rescue. It was a, you know, uh, elderly couple, they couldn't lift the door. Something we didn't know about until we did the drill. And so if you don't, if you have a, if you go out, see if you can lift it. If you can't lift it, our recommendation is pull the car outside in your driveway, facing out, windows up, load it up, ready to go. And then arrange for temporary housing. We will have a shelter set up for you. It will take a while to set up. But, uh, you know, if you don't mind sleeping on cots in a big gym with, you know, a couple hundred other people, um, it, you know, it's a shelter and it's food. And, uh, and you're going to be informed there. But if you can arrange for outside housing somewhere, you know, a neighbor, uh, I mean, a friend that lives, you know, maybe across the other, you know, other side of Reno or something, that might, might help you. Call your outer area contact number. Have an outer area contact number. <clears throat> Again, this is something where you have someone in New York City sees that we had a major disaster here in Washoe County. They're going to be calling to try and get a hold of you. Lines could be down. They could be worried. Uh, so as soon as you know, you're told to evacuate if there's a fire or something, call that outside area. Hey, we'll check in with you in four or five days. We're okay. We're going to get out. So let them know that, hey, something's going on. So they're not trying to, get up, trying to jam the lines getting in. Prop a ladder on the outside of your home. If you have a ladder, prop it on the outside of your house. What that will do is help the fire department if they're driving or ch patrolling the area, checking for hot spots and stuff. If they see an ember up on your house and your roof's on fire or something, they can get to that uh, problem quicker. And they can use the ladder, run up it, and put it out with the garden hose you have connected. Because a lot of these engines that are coming in on brush engines, they don't carry ladders on them. Or also, uh, you know, myself, uh, I'm in a Suburban driving around, so I don't have a ladder and stuff. So if you have that available for me, I'll be able to help put out the little fires. Again, this is all stuff if you have time. Uh, or sh and then make sure you shut off your propane or your gas meter. On the gas meter, on the propane is pretty easy. It's a little knob. Uh, on the gas meters, uh, my recommendation, go down to Walmart or go to a tool store and get a wrench, uh, a crescent wrench, to f and have it tied to your gas meter. The reason being is if you have a gas leak and, you know, due to an earthquake or uh, time to evacuate, you don't want to be going in your garage looking for a wrench that's going to fit on that gas meter and close it off. So tie it around there, just buy a 99 cent one, and uh, just tie it there and it's readily available for you to do. Again, these are all things that our residents have done. And again, I didn't time him. I wasn't there. I was doing the drill. He got it down. It was 23 minutes, he's saying. But he didn't have any animals. So he was able to do all this stuff uh, in 23 minutes and get in his car and go. So that's pretty good. Next time, next drill, I'm going to time him. So stay informed. <clears throat> turn on your TV. Turn on your radio. We're going to get the message out that way. Radios. Um, through the television, through your phone trees. We're going to get the message out through the phone trees once you get them established. Just like it says, it's voluntary. It's saying, hey, the threat is there, but it might not get there. If we catch it, it might not get there. If the winds stay the way they're going, it's not going to get there. But, you know, to be safe, our recommendation is to get the, when we voluntary, we're asking people to leave so we can get in there faster and fight the fire. And why the problem during evacuation is you guys are trying to leave we're trying to get equipment in. Our equipment's a lot bigger, so we cannot maneuver through the crowds. So it's going to delay our process of evacuation. So if we ask you to voluntarily evacuate, our recommendation is you start loading up and evacuating. Mandatory evacuation. Mandatory evacuation, we cannot force you to leave your home. But once we put up a mandatory evacuation, if you are not in your home, we cannot, we, can, we, can for, we cannot let you back in. So if we have a roadblock up, we can stop you from going back into your residence. But as it states right now with our attorney general, we cannot force you to leave. So once you're in your residence. But by you staying there, Australia, they thought they could stay and defend their home. 200 and some people lost their lives. I, had some, I have video that I can show you. They thought they were prepared. Whole residents, they thought they could stay, prepare, defend their home. They were good to go. 16 people lost their lives. Southern California, 
uh, three years ago. Um, Colorado, four are still missing. They thought they could stay and defend their home. But if we ask you to evacuate, we're not. Evacuation is a big headache for us. So it's not like we just say it because we want you to do it. We have a lot of planning to do. And we have to figure out how we're going to shelter a thousand people. Where are we going to do this? How are we going to get all these people out while we're trying to get in? It's not an easy process for us. That's why we practice it. So by us telling you ahead of time where we might be giving you two, three hours, some areas we might tell you a day ahead of time. Uh, we've had fires in the area where we're like, okay, it's a timber fire. It's going to take a whole day to get to this neighborhood. We're going to evacuate that neighborhood today. So we're not dealing with the problem when the fire's there. So we might ask you to evacuate a day, two days ahead of a fire. If a fire is big enough, Colorado, they're evacuating residents right now. Where they're expecting the fire not to hit that residence in, uh, on Friday. They're expecting that's where the fire is going to be by Friday. And when they're asking them to leave now. So if we're asking you to evacuate, I would evacuate. Again, the media is only one way for us to get the information out. If you get a phone call in the reverse 911 system to evacuate, I would evacuate. If you have official people in your area telling you to evacuate, I would evacuate. Uh, and if the media is not on the same page, don't rely on them. If you see official people asking to evacuate, evacuate. When you evacuate, we have signs up here. Uh, evacuated and water source. Again, um, the water source sign, I'll start with that. The water source sign is, again, we're going to have fire departments coming in helping to fight the fire that's not familiar with the area. The local fire department might know you have a pond in your backyard or a pool or even a big hot tub in your, in your backyard. Um, but outside agencies are not going to know that. If you evacuate on your way out, tape this to your front window, and if you have a water source, if you have a water source, tape it to your front window, and uh, we can use your hot tubs. Some hot tubs are three, four, five hundred gallons. Our brush trucks carry five hundred gallons of water. We have a pump that can suck that water out and help fight a fire. So if you have a water source in your area, in your, in your, on your property, place this in your window. It will help us as the, as the fire department. Evacuated signs. And once you evacuate, we ask you to put this in your front window. The reason being is when we ask you to evacuate, you saw the people on the UTVs and ATVs driving around asking to volunteer evacuate. They're going to go door to door if we evacuate an area, go door to door and make contact with the residents or try to make contact with the residents. If no one answers the door, they're going to do a quick walk around the property if they can to see if you're in the backyard or see if you're in the home. Uh, if you have this sign up, they won't have to do that. They, they know you're evacuated, they'll tag your house and move on. So this just helps our search and rescue and also helps the firefighters m move through the evacuation process a lot faster. Now people are concerned if they put this in the window when we evacuate an area, people are just going to come in and, hey, it's time to rob you. During our drills, that was an issue. People were, a couple of years into it, people didn't want to leave their homes because we're saying, hey, we're doing a big drill, come down to Galena High, and we're going to have all these people from downtown Reno or wherever and come up and rob it. Well, we had, during our drills, it's probably the safest area during the drill. We, during our grizzly fire, we had a lot of Washoe County sheriffs there. We had the military, we had NHP, we had Raven flying over. So basically, that was the safe area, and everyone was out of their home. So if you were in the other part of Washoe County, you could probably get away with anything for a couple hours. <laughs> so, because so, everyone was hit in Galena. So we're aware of that problem. So if we ask you to evacuate, we're going to bring in law enforcement. We're going to, if Raven can fly over the area. We're going to have Raven up in the area to try and secure the area. We're, going to, we're, we're aware that, hey, we're asking you to leave. Your home is going to be left open. Uh, so we're asking, so we'll have extra law enforcement there. And that's another reason why we have roadblocks. Once we put up roadblocks, the sheriff is going to not let anyone through. Again, securing the area because, number one, it's unsafe, uh, but also securing your property so people don't rob, uh, just, you know, break into your home and rob you. 
Now let's talk about fast moving fire. Um, this is where uh, the information's not going to get out. You might actually see the fire start. Might be a lightning start right in your backyard or on top of the hill and coming down. The information's not going to get out uh, to tell you to evacuate. So if you feel threatened, grab your to-go bag and go. Get out. Uh, and report it. Once you get to a safe area, report the fire. Or if you feel safe as you're evacuating, call it in. Obviously, the goal is to keep the fire small or the problem small. Uh, call it, get the help coming. Uh, again, you might be the first person or, uh, reporting it. Remember, life before property. If you feel unsafe about trying to even put it out or anything, the goal is to get out safe. Life is more important than the property. Grab your to-go bag and go. Uh, report it as you evacuate. Uh, are you going to go through this checkoff list? No. You're going to grab your to-go bag, go. If you can close your windows on your way out, um, that's good. That's one thing I skipped over on that. Uh, it's on the checkoff list, though. Uh, if you have your windows open, close all your windows for the embers to uh, not be able to get in. Uh, we went over closing the vents. But also, if you have sheer drapes, really fine drapes, you know, honeycomb shape uh, drapes, if you have those against your window, either pull them tight or take them down. Uh, because just from radiant heat can cause the fire, uh, cause them to catch fire, and you'll have a fire inside the house just from the radiant heat. So those are a couple of things you might uh, want to do if you have time. Now, if you're unable to evacuate, you're going to want to call 911 as soon as possible. You know, somehow you didn't get the message, the fire started right in your backyard, you got trapped. Or you had some kind of medical condition where you just had surgery, you can't drive, you can't get out. Call 911 right away. Let us know right away. We will do everything we can to get to you. Search and Rescue has special teams trained up with us, special equipment, special vehicles to get into tighter areas to help evacuate people. Uh, we practice this. It works well. Uh, again, if we can get to you, we will. Our, if we get notified that someone's trapped, we know your address, know your location, we're going to send a team in to get you as, soon, as soon as we can. Uh, keep all your, if you're trapped, stay inside. Keep all your doors and windows closed. Stay inside. It's going to be a lot worse outside. Stay away from all the exterior walls. Try and stay in the middle of your house. You know, your, your house is going to take a lot of the radiant heat. Temperature outside is going to be, could hit over 1,000 degrees. The flame front's right there. Inside is going to be a lot cooler. Obviously, if your house catches on fire, you can ride it out for a little bit and then get outside. But let the flame front take the, your house take the initial heat from the flame front. Uh, if you're, you know, again, if you're disabled or had something uh, where you're not going to be able to drive, needing extra assistance, notify your local fire department, hey, or your phone tree, if you have phone trees established, that hey, I'm, I'm going to need extra help if we have something going on for the next couple, well, you know, next couple weeks. It, we'll make a note of it in our books. During the fire, what to expect? You're evacuating. Um, you're going to expect road closures. Maybe when the fire started a day ago or a couple hours ago and they already evacuated areas. Some roads are going to be closed. Find more than one way out. Uh, have that already pre-planned and more than one way out. Uh, if you need to get through a roadblock, Explain to the law enforcement there why you would have to get by. Again, the roadblock is there because, number one, it's unsafe, and number two, we're trying to secure the residents that we evacuated. If you have children left at home or something there, or some reason why you have to get there, explain that to the officer. He'll radio the incident commander, and we'll get maybe an escort for you, or we'll send in a team, like large animals. Animal Services of Washoe County, they train with us on how to go in. They have volunteers and trailers on going in and getting, uh, rescuing the animals, the large animals and stuff. But they only have uh, eight trailers, eight horse trailers. So they're not going to be able to get every single horse. So if you have large animals, you're going to want to make sure you have a plan, that your neighbor has a horse trailer, you have a horse trailer. Someone has the capabilities of collecting the large animals and getting them out, not relying on the county 
with to bring their vehicles up and get the animals out. We'll do our best, but we don't have all the resources to do that. Again, they only have eight horse trailers. So they're not going to be able to load up that many horses. And by the time they get up there, it's going to be, uh, you know, it could be already too late. So I already have that plan ahead. And also on your large animals, have a plan where you're going to store them. So uh, again, the county's going to send up, set up holding pins if we have to evacuate large animals, but make sure you have a plan on yourself too. Never drive through uh, the roadblock or find the backways. You guys know the backways of your area. Never try and follow, find the backway. What that's going to do is create someone that else is watching that's trying to get in to maybe rob the ho homes. They're going to watch the locals on how they're getting around roadblocks, and they're going to get in the backway with you. Again, when the roadblocks are there because it's unsafe for you to be there. Uh, we're not just putting up roadblocks because we want to. It's an unsafe situation. And again, by you going around them, it's causing problems to lead other people into the area that shouldn't be there. After the fire passes, what should you expect? You'll be notified by law enforcement or uh, by the fire department that it's safe to go back in to your area. We're going to let start people let uh, people back into the area. This is going to take some time. We're not just going to open the gate and say, okay, everyone come back. What we're going to do is have a check-in point. We're going to have, have your ID out. We're going to verify that you're the one supposed to be there going into that area. Again, we just don't want to open the gates and have all these people that are not supposed to be there trying to get in there before the real residents are there and rob the homes and trying to get pictures and trying to get, you know, all that. So it's going to take a long process. So once we say, hey, we're going to open up this area, don't expect it's, you're going to be in there within an hour or so. Plan on sitting there waiting, go through the process, pass the word, hey, if we just follow the directions, we're going to get through faster. And we're doing it for uh, our, your safety. Um, and that's why, we're, why it takes a long time. Once you get to your home, though, check your roof, exterior your home for hot spots. Embers can sit there for days and burn and start up a couple of days later. We've had that happen where fire comes through, embers are all over the place, it looks good, but then you have that wood pile, you have something in your attic, you have something under your deck. A day or two later, we hit a fire going. So we're going to keep patrolling your area. So keep on walking around your house, checking your area, checking your house. You know, just don't. Uh, you know, that's one thing that, you know, could, you could lose your house for uh, just by one little ember. Uh, again, check underneath your decks, your attics. Uh, if you have shrubs by your home, uh, your wood pile, et cetera, check in those areas. Be alert of down power lines. You may see a, a line across the road or in your backyard and think, oh, that's just cable. Well, it might just be the cable line that's laying down, but up the pole a little bit further, it could be laying across the power line. Uh, we will send crews in prior to make sure the area is safe, but you can't guarantee that they were able to check every single thing. So if you see a down line from that looks like power or cable, a telephone, don't, ch don't touch it, stay away from it, notify proper authorities, and we'll come out and we'll check it and make sure it's a good line. Because usually what we'll do is, well, the power company will do is they'll come through and scan an area and they won't allow power lines to still be laying down the ground. They'll probably clean up the area before we allow residents back in so we don't have those problems. And then take caution in relighting your appliances because you shut off the gas. If you don't know how to do that, uh, we're aware of that. We're, we have MV Energy or Southwest Gas or the propane companies. They usually bring a whole mess of service techs with them when we open the area up, and they'll come through and help light the areas. Again, it might take a day or two to get your appliance relit, but if you don't, don't, don't know how to do it, be safe. Let the techs come, and eventually it'll light up, get you, get you going again. Again, you know when you're prepared when you attended a pride class, which you guys are starting to do. This is one of them. So you got one check mark off. But things change. So it's more it's recommended to just not just to go one and have them good. Like uh, Ed pointed out, during our drills, we find things every time to improve on, to get the, new, the word out. You registered at readywashoe.com. And that is for the reverse 911 system, the city watch system. 
uh, your cell phones in your, in your home. Uh, you registered with your phone tree captains. Again, <clears throat> you know, residents in your area are, are not here. But maybe if you sit down and get, get, like I said, we have some areas that just have five residents on a phone tree. It gets the message out. They just don't use it for fire. They also use it for law enforcement issues. You know, uh, we had, they activated their phone tree because they had someone walking through their neighborhood and they knew such and such was all out on vacation, but there was someone walking behind their homes. So they had their neighbor's phone numbers and were able to keep track of where this gentleman was walking and the sheriff just walked in the backyard of down the street and picked him, hooked him up. And he was, he was, he was looking for a house to break into. So the phone trees are not just for evacuation, they're also for, for the, for, um, law enforcement site too. Familiar, site, familiar yourself with the local evacuation centers. Again, where's the local, where's the nearest high school? Where, um, if, um, if you're not sure, go down to the local fire department. Hey, we have to evacuate. Where is the evacuation center? And call the emergency manager. Go on to the website. Uh, they have them all pointed out there for you. Uh, have a meeting spot with your family. Again, communications, we use cell phones every single day thinking, hey, we can rely on it. Well, an instant, when a disaster happens, you're not going to be able to use your cell phone. Uh, so have a meeting spot so you can meet up. Uh, make sure everyone knows where it is in your whole family. You assemble your uh, to-go bag and you keep it updated. And also keep on, you know, every once in a while pull this uh, check off list out and, and review it. Our recommendation is you pack your to-go bag. You have these in your to-go bag and you have the check off list with it. Some of our residents they attach a little pen to it, a marker so they can mark off things as they go. And, uh, and just keep your to-go bag there. And then you know once a year or twice a year go through it. If your medications change, do you keep it updated? Uh, your different bank accounts or credit card accounts you have, if those change, make sure you update your, your, uh, your to-go bag. And practice. We may not be able to do a large drill or a small drill in your area, but your family can practice the drill. See how long it will take you to go through this checkoff list and go through your home. And you're going to go, oh yeah, I guess I should grab this too. If I have animals, make sure I have enough food for my animals. Make sure I have enough uh, food for if you have a small children. Um, things like that. Um, by you sitting and just looking at this list, you're going to go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll do this, this. But if you actually don't walk through your home and do it, you're going to forget things. So we might not be able to evacuate your area yet. We're getting there. We're trying. Washoe County's big, uh, but we're getting there. Um, go through this and walk through your family with your family and go through it and see how long it's going to take you to evacuate. You want to bring your own crate. Uh, number one, it's going to be easier to grab your animal and stick it in the crate, put it in the car, and load crate up your car. Crate, carrier, crate, carrier, crate. <laughs> carrier. My crate is yeah. So. Goes in the back of my truck, I don't collapse it. You say carrier, it's a carrier, yeah. Either carrier or crate, yeah. Carrier. So large animals, large animals, you're going to want to have a way to load them up. Uh, as you saw in the video, the lady was home alone. She was unable to load those large animals. We were able to send a team in there to get them out. Again, that's if we have time and depending on how many people we have. But if you have a plan on how to take care of your animals, large or small, our recommendation is to bring a carrier or a crate. Now what they'll do at the evacuation centers, they'll bring their mobile unit, their mobile vet unit, and they'll bring their vet with them. So if your animal does get injured or needs medical attention, their vet is there. But if your animal is on medications, uh, you're going to want to break sure you, make sure you bring the medications too. You know, the animal, one, one of the dogs that showed up to the center, diabetic dog. She made sure she brought her insulin with her and checked her in, checked her animal in to the evacuation center. Now, once you check them into the evacuation center, uh, they don't allow them inside to the center, or they'll have an area, a separate area for the animals uh, outside or in a separate part of the school uh, if it's depending on the weather. But once you check them in, it doesn't mean, hey, 
they're at daycare. I don't need to take care of them. No, all that means is they're in a cage in a secured area. And so what you're going to need to do is they're going to tag your dog or your cat or your animal, and they're going to give you a tag, and they're going to keep accountability that way. So you're going to be responsible for coming and feeding it. You're going to be responsible for taking, coming and taking it for a walk. Uh, you are responsible for that. And so you have to check back in animal 216, and you're going to go get animal 216, and then you're going to take care of it, and then you check it back in. And when you do that, they're going to have an area where you can walk your animals, an area where you can feed them and stuff like that. So just because the doc is there, the vet's there, and all these helpers are there, doesn't mean they're free to go. You know? So um, keep that in mind. You're going to be at the center. Your animals are going to be there, so you know, uh, you, you know, at least gives you something to do is take care of your animals. But um, yeah, so good question on uh, bringing crates or carriers. Uh, have those in the garage with your to-go bag. We have a, I have them set up where I have my to-go bag for my family, and I also have them for my animals too. Uh, I have my carrier, and then I have a bag of the dog food, and I have they're not on any medication, so that's fine. And I make sure I have you know the cheap Walmart uh, leashes there too, so I don't have to be looking for them at the last minute because my daughter didn't hang it back up and where it's supposed to be. So things like that you got to think about. But it's like, and I didn't realize about that until we practiced, where you know, I was looking for my dog's leash. Well, she, and so it's all there in the kit. Things like that, I wouldn't have thought about until I practiced. So, um, so things like, you know, like I said, you want to go through and just at least walk through your checkoff list, grab, grab your stuff, and make sure you can do it. Time yourself, see how long you can do it, see how long it takes. So in your mind too, hey, they tell us we've got to voluntarily evacuate. It's going to take me 40 minutes, so I don't have time. You know, if they say, hey, it's going to be, yeah, we give you an hour, you know, to evacuate, plan on, you need to get out of there in 40 minutes. Again, uh, this is my contact information. Um, uh, that's my email. That's my cell phone. Uh, some of the important websites you might want to check out is uh, sierrafire.us. That's our website. It has uh, the maps, has the checkoff list. The evacuation signs on there, uh, but it also links you to uh, Ready Washoe, and also links you with LivingWithFire.info. Those are great websites on there. There's some great videos on LivingWithFire.info. Uh, sit down and uh, watch them. And it has a lot of good tips on there. What, how, before, during, and after a fire, what to expect. Uh, that's an important video that you should uh, take a look at. And also, there's some information about where embers can cause uh, your house to catch on fire. So a little problem things, there's a little activity thing on there. Uh, so livingwithfire.info is a great website. All these websites up here are all linked to each other too. So. And with that, a round of applause for Captain. <laughs>